What's up everybody, Mark Manson here, and uh, a big milestone just happened. We just blew past 100,000 subscribers to this channel. I, we were like, I think 77, and then like not even two weeks later, boom, 120,000. So thank you all for subscribing. I'm super humbled. I've only been doing this for a few months, so it's it's pretty awesome to, to rack up this many subscribers so quickly. And uh, I'm having a blast. So we've got a lot of cool videos coming up in the next few months, a couple big surprises, and uh, you're definitely gonna wanna tune in and check that out. So I was thinking, I answer literally hundreds of questions each week, whether it's on my website or through email or on social media, and I've never done like a full-blown AMA on YouTube before. So this morning I got on YouTube and said, hey guys, send me your questions and I will knock them out before my hair even fucking dries. So here we are, let's do it. So here's the first question. Lately I've been overthinking this quote from Yuval Noah Harari. He wrote the book, Sapiens. Quote, the human being who most seeks happiness is the one who becomes most unhappy. Do you agree with this? If yes, why? If not, why? So I absolutely agree with this. Not only do I agree with it, I wrote about it in my book, Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. In fact, I, I quoted, there's an even more famous quote that's very similar to that Harari quote, comes from the philosopher named Albert Camus. He said that you will never find happiness if you continue to seek of what happiness consists of. To me, this is like psychology 101, yet somehow our entire culture has forgotten this. If you are constantly preoccupied with what's gonna make you happy, that preoccupation will make you unhappy. In my book, I call this the backwards law, which is that the pursuit of positive experience is itself a negative experience, and the acceptance of negative experience is itself a positive experience. Now, I could get into all the nuts and bolts of, of why exactly this happens in our mind, but generally speaking, the backwards law applies to pretty much any sort of emotional experience we may have. So if you're feeling angry and you wish you weren't angry, it's just gonna make you more angry. If you're sad and you wish you weren't sad, it's just gonna make you more sad. So ultimately the argument that I make in, in my books, uh, and it's not a new argument, the existentialists have been saying it for years, the Buddhists have been saying it for millennia, the Stoics said it 2000 years ago, is that emotions are not the point. The point of life is not to feel good all the time. The point is to find something meaningful to do with your time. And if you optimize for meaning, then the happiness question will kind of take care of itself. Do you plan on writing new books? The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck and Everything is Fucked, a book about hope, absolutely changed my life and I can't thank you enough. That comes from Anya, thank you Anya. Absolutely I'm gonna write new books for two reasons. One is because I, I love writing books books are fucking great. Number two is I'm, I'm under a very large contract with HarperCollins to write more books. So you will absolutely be seeing more books from me. I may have a project coming out end of this year, 2021, that I'll, I'll talk about more later in the year. It's, it's not exclusively my book. It's a, it's a book that I collaborated with somebody else on, but I will begin writing my next book at some point this year as well. So stay tuned for more videos about that. How do you or how does one structure their day while balancing productivity, free time, shit you have to do, and relaxation? What are your strategies for getting the most of your day? This is a really good question. And you know, the productivity topic, there's a lot that's been written and said about productivity and there's a million books and YouTube channels you can find about it. So I, I'm gonna try to say something a little bit different. A lot of your productivity a lot of the, the, the optimal functioning of your productive life is actually very individual. What a lot of people miss or they don't understand is that there's no one size fits all model of productivity. So there are certain principles that are generally correct. You know, So wake up early tends to make people more productive. Doing the most important things first in your day tends to make people more productive. Minimize task switching between lots of different things. That tends to make people more productive but there's gonna be variance from individual to individual. Now let me give you an example from my own life. So one thing I learned pretty early on when starting my business is that I don't like routine. Like it just, I, I mentally do not respond well to too much routine. For whatever reason, my brain thrives a little bit on chaos. And so I actually discovered pretty early on in my career that 
taking like a random Thursday off and doing something really weird with my time or, you know, just sitting around playing video games and then working on Saturday and Sunday instead, like that actually invigorated me. It made me more productive. So a lot of my productivity function is simply paying attention to my emotional state, paying attention to when I'm getting kind of burnt out or, or uh, ground down by too much routine and then intentionally spicing it up in some way. Now that advice is very shocking and weird to a lot of people. Um, you know, generally you're supposed to answer these questions with things like, I get up at fucking four in the morning and I fucking drink kale and beet juice till seven and I do a million push-ups and I'm completely done with my day by 12 and then I go to my second job and I fucking crank that shit out. I think what a lot of people miss with the productivity question is that strategically placing time for leisure and for turning your brain off maximizes productivity. I actually wrote an article on my website about this. I believe it's called uh, How to Get More Done by Working Less. It's all about how there's a diminishing returns to the amount of hours you put into any task during the day. Another thing that's, that's particularly personal to me is I'm just not productive in afternoons. I don't know what it is. I'm 36, I've been trying this shit for like my entire adult life. A lot of my work days end up being something like work really hard in the morning, kind of like do email, social media, bullshit in the afternoon, maybe take a nap, maybe play some video games, maybe hang out with my wife. Uh, and then starting around, you know, five, 6 p.m., start doing a little bit of work again. And then if I'm feeling up to it, if I'm feeling inspired, then I'll work say 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. and go to bed around 11. So that's me, that's a very personal thing for me and that's just something that I've discovered as work. So uh, I guess my point with all this is that this is a personal question. There are general principles that are true for everybody, but a lot of this is personality based. And so if you're a young person, start exploring different configurations of your time and, and, and your relaxation and try to discover what works best for you. Another quote, this time from Mark Twain, I never let schooling interfere with my education. Do I agree? <laughs> I feel like it's very fashionable to shit on education, particularly higher education these days. It's kind of become a meme that college isn't worth it and you're wasting your time. As with everything, it depends and that's not a sexy or popular answer but it depends. Like if you're going into mathematics, then yeah, school is probably very important. Like mathematics, you need to build upon certain foundations and you need a teacher there to help explain concepts to you or else everything just falls apart. With something like history, the curriculum at a particular school, it's very arbitrary. You know, it's like what we decided is important in history, there's no like, objective answer to that. And so if you get super interested in like ancient Chinese history, there's nothing to say that that's not more useful or correct for you than, you know, whatever they teach you in your high school. So to me, this is subject dependent. It's also goal dependent. Depends what you want to do with your life. If you want to be a startup founder or a professional musician or go into like nonprofit work, charity work, yeah, a lot of school's probably gonna be useless for you, if not detrimental in some ways. If you wanna become a doctor, if you wanna become an engineer, then school's probably going to be very important. So it all depends on, on what you're looking for and what your goals are. Generally speaking, as a rule, whenever, uh, whenever people are like, this big social thing is all good or all bad, it's neither. It's somewhere in between. Next question, what are your five favorite nonfiction books on social issues that you would recommend us to read. All right, you made me go to the bookshelf on this one. The first one I would recommend, this is pretty American centric, but uh, Chasing the Scream by Johan Hari. Johan Hari, it's about the drug war. Longtime readers of mine, subscribers to the email newsletter, um, know that I am completely for the decriminalization of drugs. Uh, I think the war on drugs is maybe the stupidest and one of the most devastating policies in the United States since like slavery. Like it's just, it's abominable in so many ways. Drug addiction, it, it's a mental health issue. It is not a criminal issue and making it a criminal issue just makes more crime. So fucking stop it. Next one I would recommend is called Democracy for Realists. This is written by uh, Christopher Ochen and Larry Bartels. They're two political scientists from Princeton, I believe. Um, this is a sobering read. 
It's an upsetting read. It's empirical data on how electorates actually vote and function. Spoiler alert, people are fucking dumb and they vote for dumb things. The book kind of looks at, is there such thing as too much democracy? And some of the answers are a little bit upsetting. Next book is called Why Nations Fail. It's by Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson. You know, there's a lot of foreign policy and economics in this, but it's, it's a super fascinating history read as well. And it pulls from all over the world. So it looks at like colonialism and, and Zaire and the Congo, the Mexican revolution in 1911, it looks at the American revolution, it looks at the opening of China, it looks at all these historical examples and it pulls certain commonalities to why certain countries or nations fail, but also looks at why some nations thrive and uh, become very economically prosperous. So the next author, uh, I'm a huge fanboy. This is called The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker. The subtitle is The Modern Denial of Human Nature. I, I just, I love Pinker. Um, he's become kind of controversial on the left recently, which is fucking ludicrous. Anybody who thinks Steven Pinker is controversial, has not read Steven Pinker. Pinker is just a, a, a genius at collecting a vast amount of research and data and then systematically explaining it to push like a very big picture argument or idea. Uh, and The Blank Slate is all about kind of politic, not politically motivated, but ideologically motivated denial of, of genetics, of how genetics affect life, how genetics affect people, how it affects gender, how it affects economic outcomes. Things that we don't really like thinking about, but unfortunately the science shows us over and over again is true. Another Pinker favorite, Better Angels of Our Nature. This, this thing is, I mean, you could, you could kill a small child with this book if you wanted to. But this book is about violence and it's basically about why the world is becoming less violent and more prosperous and more empathetic despite all of our perceptions to the contrary. It'll definitely shift your perspective about humanity quite a bit. So those are five, but I, I have to, I can't do a recommendation list like this without throwing these other books in. The other person I'm a huge fanboy of is, is uh, a political scientist named Francis Fukuyama. Um, this is kind of his magnum opus. It's a two-parter, uh, Origins of Political Order and then Political Order and Political Decay. And what Fukuyama does is he basically traces the emergence of modern civilization beginning in ancient China, through ancient India, the Middle East, all the way up through the Enlightenment and the American French revolutions. And then the, the second book really gets into why certain political systems uh, prosper and why certain political systems fail. And it is endlessly fascinating. I mean, it is like 1200 pages, so you really need to be kind of like a, a history and political dork uh, like I am to, to enjoy it. But it is one of those big picture books that seemingly just kind of explains everything about human politics uh, in a nutshell. So huge recommendation for that. Do you know the MBTI personality test? If yes, what is your opinion about it and about personality tests in general? Thanks for your content. I am familiar with MBTI. I actually made um, like a 30 minute video for my website members on markmanson.net. So if you're a member of the site or if you wanna sign up for the site, you can check that out. I, I break down in detail um, the MBTI, why it became popular, why it's seen as authoritative, even though it's not. So MBTI, I, I hate to break it to you guys, um, I know it's fun, I know it's like really interesting to talk about, but the MBTI is basically a very fancy horoscope. Um, there is almost no empirical data backing up its utility. It was invented in the 40s and quickly dropped by psychologists by the 60s for the big five model of personality, which there is a ton of data for. Yet the reason MBTI survives is that the business consulting industry picked up on it and started making a shitload of money telling CEOs and presidents of companies that they could increase productivity and efficiency by matching employees and creating teams based on MBTI types. It's all bullshit. Look, it's fun and I get emails, fuck, every week people ask me what my MBTI type is. I'm an INTP. Don't take it too seriously. On the other hand, you know, there's a whole field of psychology, personality psychology, the big five model is kind of the preeminent model in that field of psychology. There's a lot of data on the big five model. There's a lot of 
predictive data on the big five model. That said, it's, it's still not without controversy. Let me just put it this way. Like if I asked you a question, I said, do you like hanging out with people? And every, you know, and you said yes, then I'd be like, oh, so you're a type of person who likes hanging out with people. Now, the data would, would be significant and it would match up, but am I actually telling you anything original or useful about yourself? Like that's kind of the cri criticism of personality data is that you, we basically invent these models and then create questionnaires that only like push people to fit into the model. And so that doesn't actually tell us how useful the model is. I don't know if I buy that. I tend to think that, you know, given what we know about genetics and everything, that there probably are fundamental personality types um, and those do have consequences on outcomes. But I think it's just important to say that it, it's, it's an area of psychology that is still debated quite frequently. Have you any familiarity with David Foster Wallace's commencement speech, This Is Water? Have you any thoughts on said speech? Uh, yeah, I am a David Foster Wallace fanboy. Um, I have read all of his work. Um, actually, David Foster Wallace is probably the person that made me want to become an author. Actually, if you go to markmanson.net slash archive, scroll all the way to the bottom, you will find that in August 2010, I posted the, the entire This Is Water speech on my website. So not only am I familiar with the speech, it has been on my website for over 10 years now. It's I've probably read it or listened to it 10 or 15 times. It's one of my favorite things ever written. I think there's so much wisdom in it. He's just such a brilliant mind and amazing author. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I could gush for hours and hours about it. But yes, it's an amazing speech. I love it. It's been very impactful for me. And, and I agree with pretty much all the points in it. Have you read any of Jordan Peterson's books? And if so, what are your thoughts on them? I have. I've read 12 Rules for Life. I have Maps of Meaning. I have not read it. It's funny, I get asked about Jordan Peterson all the time. I would describe myself as a mild fan. Let me put it this way. I really, really agree with him on like 60 to 70% of what he says. And then I just kind of flat out disagree on maybe 30 to 40%. With everything he says about existentialism, values, um, when he talks about Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, responsibility, I'm 100% on board. 100%. And in fact, I actually, I, I got a chance to meet and talk to him for a few hours for the first time a couple weeks ago. And he and I just riffed on existentialist ideas and, and responsibility and personal accountability pretty much the whole time. He's a pretty serious dude, um, very intense. But yeah, I, I like him and I, I think he gives good advice. Obviously he's super knowledgeable. He comes from a, a, like a very well-read, well-studied background. I think a lot of the, the media criticism of him is hyperbolic and exaggerated. The stuff that I'm not so on board with is the religion stuff. I'm not as much of a Jungian as he is. Jung didn't do a whole lot for me. And then he he really has a thing about Christianity and the Bible. And that's cool. I totally respect that. A lot of people, obviously, like over a billion people on the planet do. Uh, I don't. I, I'm, I'm more skeptical of the religion stuff. So yeah, it's a mixed bag. I, I really like what he's saying, what he's putting out there. Um, I don't agree with all of it but that's fine. One of the things that's so mesmerizing about Peterson is, is, is like he seems to bring this like religiosity out of people. Like he, he, the people are like, like psychophant, like pro Peterson zealots where everything he says is fucking gold and he's saving society or, or people are like, he's the antichrist and he's, he's evil and he's a bigot and he's all these things. And I, it's like, neither is true. He's a really smart guy with a lot of really interesting ideas. And I really like, a lot of them, but I don't like all of them. And that's pretty much true with like every interesting thinker and author I've ever read in my life. It's been very interesting. I find his work interesting, but then I also find, you know, the brouhaha around him quite interesting as well. All right, last question. Hi, Mark, I would like to know if you think that we can use our anxieties as a superpower to push through adversity. I would say, you have no other option but to use your anxiety as a superpower to push you through adversity. It's either that or just crawl in a corner and give up. 
This is the thing about anxiety, and this, this is one of the points that I make frequently throughout my books, is like, there's no such thing as a positive or negative emotion. There are positive and negative contexts and reactions to emotions. So like, anxiety is incredibly useful. Anxiety is your nervous system mobilizing your body and preparing you for an important situation. And you can either live up to that important situation and perform well, or you can, you can crumble. It's interesting, you know, the research on anxiety, it finds that, that like say athletes like Michael Jordan, who just like fucking hit game winners left, right, and center, they still feel as much anxiety as other people. It's what's different about people like Michael Jordan is their response to the anxiety. So my answer is you have no other option but to use your anxiety as a superpower, because guess what? Anxiety is not going anywhere, man. It's part of you, it's part of life, it's not gonna end, so might as well fucking get used to it and leverage it a little bit. All right, so that's all the time we got. Stick around, uh, got some really cool shit happening over the next few months. Been really enjoying this channel. Um, I'm, I'm actually making it kind of one of my primary focuses of 2021, um, so, very excited for the content we got coming. Um, thanks for all the questions and uh, I will see you in next video.